This special presentation of Hey Ray is presented by United Healthcare. Hi there, I'm meteorologist Ray Petlin, and we use science to explain how things work. And as a meteorologist, I use science to help explain how weather works and what the weather is going to be like. And to help give you a better understanding of how things work, we put together a bunch of experiments. I hope you like them. Cool. Tornadoes get a lot of credit for being destructive in our area. And my dad gets a lot of credit for destroying pierogies in our house. That's very fair, very fair. But not every destructive storm includes a tornado, even though they can be just as destructive as a tornado. We call them downbursts. These can come in the form of large scale downbursts called macrobursts or smaller scale versions called microbursts. They start with an updraft, warm, moist air rising into the atmosphere. This feeds the storm energy and moisture and starts the process of creating large raindrops and hail. This process continues until the hail or rain becomes too big or heavy to support. No matter how strong you are, there's only so much you can hold. Sometimes the updraft can be exceptionally strong. When that happens, the rain and the hailstones are lifted into the higher parts of the storm. This often happens when there's a layer of dry air feeding into the storm, causing evaporation, which is actually a cooling process, making the air more dense or heavier. This can cause the storm's rain and hail core to fall quickly, dragging a lot of air down with it rapidly to the ground. And if there's a layer of dry air beneath the storm, the evaporation cooling process there will make the falling air even more dense, making it fall faster. When that air hits the ground, it fans out at incredible speeds in all different directions. Sometimes this air fans out over 100 miles per hour, the same wind speeds in an EF1 tornado. This wind's a little different though. It is, actually when you look at the damage from these storms, you can see the wind pattern is in straight lines. And we could show this to you with a simple experiment. It's messy though, so you're gonna need your play clothes. Let's do it. To show what happens to the air, we have a poster board to track the damage, a blob of paint to represent the track that the wind damage will take, and a leaf blower to recreate our downburst. <laughs> As you can see, the damage fans out in straight lines. Now, if this were a tornado, the damage path would be scattered in all different directions, sort of like the mess in Elizabeth's room. I guess that's fair. Scientifically, some mixtures mix well, others don't, and some mixtures just take time. Please tell me we're gonna mix up something delicious. Well, let's see if we can turn a viewer question into something delicious. So what's the question? The question is, why is there a line at the point where the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers meet to form the Ohio River? It's something you may have noticed if you watch the rivers. There is no way I'm drinking Mon Water. I don't think you need to drink Mon Water this time, but we are going to find out a different way what that line is. And for that, we're going to talk to Fred McMullen. He is a coordination meteorologist at the National Weather Service office in Pittsburgh, and they work closely with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the United States Geological Society to maintain and monitor the riverways around our area. So, Fred, what is that line? So the line is really a function of what we call rock bottom. And it's a thing where the two rivers, the Allegheny and the Mon, have different river composites. So the Mon has a siltier sandstone bottom, which is finer sand, which when we get the heavy rain, it gets stirred up more easily. And that's why you get a darker appearance of the Mon River versus the Allegheny, bigger gravel, coarser sand, and the river doesn't get stirred up as much. And therefore it kind of maintains the same color through the duration of an event versus the model which changes color. So does it take time for these ingredients to mix into the Ohio River? Yeah, and you have different components on the, on the river top. So again, so what has kind of like oil and vinegar, right? You pour oil, you mix oil and vinegar, you get a kind of a separation in the bottle. And then same thing when we have the point where we have different colors coming together because different sediments have been mixed up. And then therefore, you know, again, they differentiate, they separate, and then they eventually at some point down the Ohio River, they merge and they get diluted, and therefore the river becomes one color again. Sometimes it's lighter, sometimes it's darker. So what's the setup that makes it more noticeable? When northern West Virginia, southwestern Pennsylvania, it gets heavy rainfall. 
maybe northwestern PA doesn't get any rainfall. And so you'll definitely see the, the really stark contrast on those situations versus if we had a widespread rainfall across western Pennsylvania and northern West Virginia where the Maud begins, uh, you would see a little bit of coloration in the Allegheny, but more pronounced in the Monongahela River. That's awesome. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. All right, now let's make our own line at the point. You get to be the Monongahela River with this chocolate syrup. I'm going to be the Allegheny with this milk and mix them up. And there you have it, science. On second thoughts, I will drink Mon water. <laughs> Reporting from home. I'm Elizabeth Petlin. And I'm meteorologist Ray Petlin. Save some for me. A teenager at rest tends to stay at rest even after you ask them to do something. A dad watching sports tends to stay on the couch until they need another beverage. Well, we could do this all day, but what we're really trying to do is bring attention to inertia. The law of inertia, or Newton's first law of motion, states that an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion in the same direction and speed unless acted upon by another force. So, this fire truck will stay at rest unless another force, like my hand, makes it move. Then it's going to stay moving in its current direction, at its current speed, unless other forces cause an imbalance and change that motion. Forces like friction or gravity. You may have seen the magic trick where the magician pulls a tablecloth from under a place setting and the place setting stays put. You're not. It's for science. He normally says this right before a big mess happens. Okay, the objects on the table are at rest and their inertia will cause them to remain at rest if I do this trick right. Don't do this with your parents' nice things. And the plate stayed because of inertia. Are we gonna pretend like you didn't mess that up a million times? All right, I'm not a magician, so here we go. Mom's gonna be so mad. Okay, let's try a version of this experiment where we don't break expensive things. What you need for this is a glass of water, the bigger the better, an egg, a toilet paper or paper towel roll, and a piece of cardboard. Set the cardboard on the glass of water. Set the paper towel roll on the cardboard right over the glass. Place an egg on top on its side. Since the glass of water and the egg have more mass, they have more inertia. It takes much more of an outside or opposing force to move those than it does the lighter cardboard or the paper towel tube. They have less mass or less inertia. This means that you can hit the cardboard off to the side to move it. Since the paper towel tube has little inertia, it will get knocked out of the way too. The egg and the water with more mass will want to stay in place. Then gravity, or an outside force, will take over and cause the egg to drop straight down into the glass of water. Are we not going to mention how many eggs you broke to get this right? Sometimes you learn ways not to conduct an experiment, and sometimes science is just downright messy, like your room. I can't clean it because of inertia. The law says I must stay at rest. Unless an outside force changes that, like groundings. Why are you called a meteorologist if you predict weather and not meteors? I get that question a lot, and the short answer is I do predict meteors, just not the way you may think. To understand this, we have to go all the way back to the time of Aristotle. He wrote Meteorologica. It's the oldest comprehensive work on the subject of meteorology. That still doesn't tell us why you don't study meteors. Meteorologica contained all the knowledge they knew about the weather at that time, even though it was limited. And in Greek, anything that fell from the sky or was suspended in the atmosphere was called a meteor. This included everything in the atmosphere, like rain, sleet, snow, and hail, even rainbows and lightning. This is in addition to what we call meteors today. You know, those space rocks that hit our atmosphere. So back in that time, they called rain meteors? Yeah, and we actually still do. 
In the atmosphere, we still consider most natural things to be a meteor, just more specific. If there's dirt or dust in the atmosphere, we would call those particles lithometeors. Litho comes from the Greek word meaning stone. Meteorologists today tend to focus mainly on hydrometeors, though. This is the water in all its different forms in the atmosphere, rain, snow, hail, and sleet. So why don't you still call them meteors? Well, when I'm with some other meteorologists, I may call them hydrometeors, just like a doctor would call a heart attack to one of his colleagues a myocardial infarction. Our radars even have a function to classify the different types of precipitation it's picking up in the atmosphere. We call that function hydrometeor classification. And now you know why I'm called a meteorologist. And if you have a weather question or science question, make sure to send it my way to heyray at kdka.com. I have a question. What type of meteor is this? That's a you're grounded till you're 18 meteor. Some of the most important weather terminology for safety is often the most confused weather terminology. Mesocyclone? Not mesocyclone. Watch and warning. And while they sound very similar, they mean different things. Watches are issued when the risk of hazardous weather is elevated, but its occurrence, location, and timing is still uncertain. Watches are intended to provide you enough notice for you to get prepared for severe weather. It's basically when we know some ingredients are going to be in place. That seems simple. What is a warning? Warnings are issued when severe weather is happening or likely. A warning means that weather conditions pose a threat to life or property, and people in the path of the storm need to take protective action. It's when those ingredients start to come together. Those bulls sound pretty similar. They do, and that's why we're going to simplify this even more. Is that why there's all this stuff on the counter? Yep. We have a bunch of ingredients here for halushki noodles, but as you can see, no halushki noodles are present. Knowing that the chance for halushki noodles is elevated, though, we must issue a... Halushki noodle watch! Yes, we have the ingredients here, but there's no immediate threat for halushki noodles, so a watch is issued so you know of the halushki noodle potential. Now, as the ingredients start coming together and halushki noodles are imminent or happening, we need to issue a... Halushki noodle warning! Yes, a halushki noodle warning would need to be issued. It's no longer just ingredients in place, and a warning is putting you on notice that halushki noodles will be near you soon. I like the halushki noodle warnings more than the other ones. I think most people do. So again, the simple explanation is halushki noodle watch, halushki noodle warning. What if somebody wants to make their own halushki noodle warning? No worries, I'll put the recipe online at kdka.com. Have you ever looked at the moon coming up over the horizon and thought, wow, the moon looks so big? Only a couple hours later to see it higher in the sky and having the moon look kind of small? Well, what if I told you that was just an illusion? That's lame. Does anybody else have to work at home under conditions like this? But it is an illusion. It's your mind playing tricks on you. Check this out. Which of these moons is bigger? The one on the right actually looks a little bigger, but that's just because the perspective is changed once you look at the objects around it. And if you take all the objects away, you'll notice both these moons are actually the same exact size. This is what's called the moon illusion, and actually your brain is trying to fill in information, and because it does that, it actually inflates the size of the moon. If you think about it, as you look off into the distance, typically things get smaller. Well, the moon still looks pretty big as it's coming up over the horizon, and your brain knows it's far away, so it automatically inflates the size of the moon. So here, the moon up close, actually looks smaller than the moon far away because your brain is trained to inflate the size. But again, if you take away everything else that's giving you perspective, you find both these moons are the same size. Here's another way that your brain does the same thing. Look at this picture of me that's upside down. It looks sort of normal, but once you flip it over, you see my eyes are upside down. Ew, that's gross. Yeah, that is kind of gross. But it's another way that your brain, even though I was upside down and my eyes were right side up, sort of put everything together properly until you saw the proper perspective. Here, I hope this helps. 
So it's all just an illusion. Ray, it's a name I call myself and a drop of golden sun. Okay, Julie Andrews. Well, the sky is alive with light during the day. Stop. Anyway, that light can sometimes be seen as beams or rays. Just ask Bokey the cat. She loves to nap in them all day long, but light coming through a window is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the ray that most people include when they're drawing a picture of the sun. Definitely not those rays. Those rays. You may have seen those rays or sunbeams in real life. They're called crepuscular rays, and most often they're seen around sunrise or sunset when the sun is lower in the sky and when there are clouds or sometimes even terrain blocking the light. This creates some shadows, making for beams of light as the sun shines through the haze caused by moisture or impurities like dust in the atmosphere. It also makes for beautiful pictures. It certainly does. And we can make our own crepuscular rays at home as well. All you need is a piece of cardboard and something to poke holes in it, a flashlight, and a candle. And this experiment does use a little bit of fire, so make sure you have a responsible adult nearby. My mom's over there. All you need to do is find a dark spot and light your candle. Then shine the light through the holes of the cardboard. When you blow out the candle, your crepuscular rays will appear in the candle smoke. You can move your cardboard and flashlight around to get different crepuscular rays. Not to be confused with ray muscular rays. You're gonna need more of these before you call yourself that. One of the most attention-getting weather phenomena is the rainbow. What is that? Are you too cheap for special effects? Most of us know the basics of the bow. Since light is made up of all the colors, when the sun shines through raindrops, that light is refracted into its separate colors, giving you the rainbow. There are some things, though, that you might not know about rainbows. Like why there's so many songs about rainbows? No, Kermit the Frog. Like, why don't you see a rainbow during the middle of the day? You don't, do you? That is because the angle of the light is important. If the sun is too high in the sky, the angle makes the rainbow appear below you. You may notice this if you use a hose in the middle of a sunny day. A rainbow forms, but you actually have to look down to see it. That is why you typically see rainbows in the early morning or in the evening. Sort of like a seesaw? Exactly. As the sun goes up, the rainbow goes down. As the sun goes down, the rainbow goes up. Have you ever seen a double rainbow? Yes. If you look at both rainbows, the colors are reversed between the two. For a double rainbow, each raindrop refracts the light twice, giving the reversed color order. Do you know how to quickly find a rainbow when the sun and the rain are in place? Duh, you look at the sky. Well, yes, but rainbows always happen opposite of the sun. That means if you stand with the sun to your back, if a rainbow is going to show up, it'll happen in front of you. Sounds simple. It is. Here's another cool fact. Rainbows are actually full circles. When you're standing on the ground, you can only see 180 degrees of it, or half the rainbow. To see the full circle of the rainbow, you actually need to view it from above. I was able to recreate this by using a hose and holding a camera above my head. Maybe you can find the pot of gold and afford better special effects next time. <sighs> During the daytime, you can't see the stars or sometimes planets that you can see at night. Duh, because it's light out? Well, yeah, but at nighttime, you may be missing out on stars and planets because of sort of the same thing, a thing called light pollution. There's a light pollution? You may have heard about air pollution or water pollution, but light can be a form of pollution too. To learn more about light pollution, let's talk to our friend Mike Hennessy from the Buell Planetarium at the Carnegie Science Center. Hey Mike, what is light pollution? Uh, light pollution is a lot of unneeded, unnecessary light uh, beyond what's actually being used that's being scattered into the atmosphere. Uh, it can harm human health, it can harm wildlife, uh, it can also uh, just impact our ability to enjoy the night sky. So if people weren't producing their own light, we'd be able to see a whole lot more? Exactly. So. Just a hundred years ago, everyone around the planet pretty much was able to enjoy a view of uh, a star strewn sky littered with stars to be able to see into the band of the Milky Way galaxy uh, during the summer months. Uh, and now most folks around the world uh, just don't have that opportunity to enjoy all that beautiful starlight that nature can afford us. 
Wait, you could have seen the Milky Way from Pittsburgh? You really could have. Uh, and that's not to say that we can't enjoy our city lights as well, uh, but it is a matter of, I think, choosing the right technologies and the right applications, uh, even the right colors and temperatures of our lighting to make sure that we can preserve the sky above us as well as the, the lights that we're doing artificially at ground level. Light pollution is more problematic than just looking at stars, right? I think that's a good point. Um, and it really is a big issue because light pollution uh, is energy uh, inefficient. Um, so it's estimated that at least 30% of all the lighting that we're casting outside is, is wasted light. It's not being put to good use. What can we do about light pollution? Yeah, I think a few more ways folks can help are um, motion detectors and timers. Uh, that's a great way to make sure that you are using the light to make sure things are safe at night, but you're, you're doing it at just the right times. Um, shielding on lights, shielding and directing light is very important. There are a lot of ways that we can, can help kind of take back our heritage of the night sky. But along with that, I would also say that even uh, in areas with high light pollution, there's still a lot to enjoy. So get outside uh, this May, get outside this summer, give your eyes some time to adapt uh, and get outside and enjoy the stars. We will. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. I guess it is good you walk around the house turning off all the lights like every other dad. I guess so. We're going to share some of the other resources Mike gave us on KDKA.com so you can learn more about light pollution and how to combat it. There's an old saying that there's more than one way to skin a cat. No. Bokey is gonna be okay. Trust me on that one. She knows. It just means that there's more than one way to accomplish a goal. And in science, let me tell you, some ways are much cooler than others. Here, we have a burning candle. How can we put the flame out? We can blow it out, we can pour water on it, or we can just put a lid over the flame until it runs out of oxygen or we can use a fire extinguisher. That's a safety device, so we're not gonna play with it, but we're gonna use the same principles to put it out invisibly. What? Fire needs oxygen to be in contact with whatever it's burning for combustion, plain old air. And when oxygen is used by the flame, carbon dioxide is left behind. No oxygen, no flame. Many fire extinguishers actually contain carbon dioxide to help extinguish fires. What does this have to do with the weird thing you did to blow the candle out? Well, since we know that carbon dioxide is denser than air... You can dump it? You can dump it. You can dump carbon dioxide onto the flame, pushing the oxygen away, making the flame go out. Let's make some carbon dioxide. To do that, we need vinegar, baking soda, and two glasses. You may have seen the vinegar and baking soda thing before. You put some vinegar in one of the glasses, then you add the baking soda, and you see a chemical reaction start up. Those bubbles you see are actually carbon dioxide being released. And since carbon dioxide is heavier or denser than oxygen, the carbon dioxide pushes the oxygen out of the glass, leaving the CO2 behind. Let the chemical reaction finish. And so we don't spill vinegar onto the flame. We're gonna carefully dump the carbon dioxide into the other glass. It's invisible, just like air, so you have to trust that this is happening. The carbon dioxide is also pushing the air out of the glass as you pour it in. Try not to let any vinegar get into the new glass. Now, with a glass full of invisible carbon dioxide, you can just dump it onto the flame, and the flame is extinguished. Now, if you try this experiment at home, it does use a flame, so make sure there's a responsible adult nearby. Don't worry, my mom's been supervising this whole thing. I'm an adult. We have covered a lot of topics and done a lot of experiments. That's given me a lot of opportunities to make fun of my dad for you. And I think that's the most popular part of this. Anyhow, we are going to revisit one of those topics and that is density. And we're gonna go into the equation of density to what makes it up and play around with it to make for one weird science experiment today. We've talked about density before. Remember, if an object is more dense than what's surrounding it, it will sink. If it's less dense than what's surrounding it, it will float. That sounds pretty simple. That's why we're gonna do an experiment that pushes the limits of these basic concepts. Since density is mass per unit volume, we draw the equation this way. Mass over volume equals density. Ew, that sounds mathy. It does, but that math actually gives us hints as to how to control how certain things act. When you have an equation like this, it's a way of saying density and volume have an inverse relationship. If you increase the density, the volume decreases. If you increase the volume, the density decreases. Let's show this as an experiment. 
finally. All we need is a plastic bottle filled to the tippy top with water and something that's become a rare substance. Is that a... Yep, a ketchup packet, and they're supposed to be very hard to come by. But we have a whole drawer of those. Shh. Let's continue with the science. You put the ketchup packet in the bottle and put the lid on. What's happening here? It's floating. It is. There's a little air in that ketchup packet, so it makes it less dense than the water around it, so it floats. Now give the bottle a squeeze. What? It sinks when you squeeze the bottle, so you must be doing something to increase the density of the ketchup packet. Now let go, and you see the ketchup packet floats again. All I did was squeeze the bottle. When the volume decreased, the density increased, just like the equation. Remember, we filled the bottle to the tippy top. That means there's no air in the bottle except for the little bit of air in the ketchup packet. In the bottle, that floats. That is, until you squeeze the bottle. When you squeeze the bottle, the water squeezes the ketchup packet. This compresses the air in that packet so it can't take up as much space, making the packet more dense than the water. It's just like magic. It is, and it's one of those experiments that you could treat like a magic trick, especially if you pretend to move the packet with your mind. Quit being weird. All right, I'll stop being weird. We're going to put some tips on how to make this experiment work best on kdk.com. Reporting from home, I'm Elizabeth Petlin. And I'm meteorologist Ray Petlin. Float. Float. Stop. So cool! I hope you liked those experiments and I hope they gave you a better idea of how things work. Remember, they're all online for you at kdka.com. And if you ever have a question about how something works, just send me an email. Hey Ray at kdka.com. This special presentation of Hey Ray is presented by United Healthcare.